Welcome back. This is Intro to Physical Anthropology, and I am your instructor, David Leitner. Uh, today, we are embarking on the beginning of our journey talking about Neanderthals. So, uh, just want to give you a sort of brief introduction of uh, what a Neanderthal is, their relationship to other hominins, and uh, also a little bit about the history of uh, how they were discovered, but also how they've been portrayed uh, and how we understand them now. Uh, with that said, let's get started. Okay, just as a reminder, uh, for Neanderthals, we're looking at this sort of periods from really possibly as early as sort of three or 400,000 years ago up until about 27,000 years ago. Uh, the best evidence for them comes in the past 150 to 200,000 years. Um, uh, and uh, they don't come into contact with modern, uh, anatomically modern humans until about 40,000 years ago. So we're talking about this time period here. Now remember, Neanderthals are probably the descendants of the regional European archaic Homo sapiens, maybe also Homo antecessor. Uh, but, um, uh, they are far more complex, uh, than that hominin is. Uh, in recent years too, we've begun discovering really new important things about Neanderthals. Uh, we used to think they weren't very complex. We're starting to find out they might be more complex than we, uh, thought we thought they didn't have certain kinds of technology now we're finding some evidence for that we thought they didn't have uh do certain things uh, like uh bury the dead and now we're starting to find that they actually they do seem to have some complex funerary practices so everything we understand about neanderthals has completely changed over the past 20 years uh and in no small part certainly to due to the archaeological and anthropological work but also because the um, Neanderthal genome was uh, sequenced and published in 2009, which has actually allowed us to understand that our early ancestors in Europe, if you're if you have ancestors in Europe, uh, encounter or the Middle East, I should say, and maybe even parts of Asia, uh, when our ancestors encountered Neanderthals, very often they um, they mixed with each other. They mated with each other. What that says to me, what that says to a lot of scientists, is that our ancestors very much saw these creatures not as a different species, but as other people on the landscape. People. Like us. So, uh, so bear that in mind. Okay, what's the climate like during this time period? Again, we've got these cycles, major cycles of glaciation and interglacial periods, right? Especially starting about 120,000 years ago, uh, uh, we start having a decline in temperatures that reaches its maximum about 18,000 years ago and then begins to recover. Uh, we should actually be on the start of a decline right now, but because of modern global warming uh, and greenhouse effects, we've actually reversed that, which we should be very concerned about. But I've talked about that before. Um, taxonomic debates. It's not as big of a de debate anymore, but it used to be a much bigger one. Is it Homo neanderthalensis, in other words, are Neanderthals their own species, or are they Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, their own subspecies? Um, well, it depends on the phylogenetic model you use and what definition of species you use. If you are adhering strictly to the interbreeding definition, then you would say that they are just a subspecies. Uh, because we have evidence that they interbred. On the other hand, our phy phylogenetic models don't point to a common origin in the same species. Uh, 
at all. They have their own independent appearance in uh, in Europe. So that would make them a different species. Uh, again, like I say, science is as much about sort of convincing other people your argument is correct as, as it is about uh, uh, anything else. By and large... I think most anthropologists nowadays consider them a species, a separate species, and not and largely because of the phylogenetic data. Biology in general, too, we put less and less importance on that interbreeding th definition, too, uh, nowadays. Not always, but sometimes we realize, actually, like in this case, sometimes things can have separate origins and still be closely enough related to intermingle. Um, all right, so the Neanderthal range looks something like this. Uh, all of Western Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, the Near and Middle East, West Asia, parts of Siberia. What are those other places in Europe that aren't covered by it, as well as some of those parts of, of Western Asia? Well, those were giant ice sheets. Uh, there was one over the Himalaya that expanded considerably during this time, and of course the polar ice sheet, um, the other side of which was covering half of North America, right? So, uh, so yeah, they couldn't inhabit things further <laughs> north than that. Um, so that is the appearance. We're starting to find more and more, interestingly, we're starting to find more and more evidence, not only of uh, Neanderthals, in particularly in Israel and Jordan in that area, uh, but we are uh, also finding more and more evidence for uh, the interactions between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens uh, early on there as well. So, very interesting stuff. Okay, where do they come from? The first discovery was actually discovered before on the origin of species and was not identified as a separate species initially. Uh, the first Neanderthal fossil comes to us in 1830 in the Angus Cave. It was a small child, probably two to three years old. Uh, the second, found at Gibraltar in 1848, uh, was actually just perceived to be a, a sick, uh, just basically an arthritic old man. Uh, in fact, actually, that discovery in particular influenced... Uh, when it was decided that this was a separate species, uh, it, 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 it was an arthritic individual, and it influenced the depictions later on. So the assumption was they were all hunched over like that, with enlarged joints and, and, and that sort of thing. They didn't know that much about the anatomy of arthritis at that point, I think. Interestingly, too, another thing to point out about this is an image that sat in Paris's Musée de L'Homme uh, for a long time, and it should be recognized that um, both France and Germany had their own hominins for a long time. So Neanderthal, Neanderthal is a German word that means the Neander Valley because that's where uh, that's where the first uh, uh, specimen was found. Uh, the French, on the other hand, had Cro-Magnon, which is, was, again, named after the place, uh, but Cro-Magnon man was an anatomically modern human. So, the French, of course, having, <laughs> in a, in a peak of chauvinism, couldn't believe that the less evolved Germans you know, would have something that was vaguely human-like. So they came up with this very ape-like, uh, and frankly, in many ways, in some ways racist, uh, in some ways uh, classist um, view of Neanderthals. So this was, for many in, in France and many in the English-speaking world, this was the image of Neanderthals, since, I mean, they're from Germany, right? So how could they be civilized? Um... I'm saying that sarcastically, obviously. Um, so that was the image for a long time. Well, that image doesn't go away easily. Uh, for most of the 20th century, we've got depictions of even 
even when they're sympathetic depictions of uh, Neanderthals, they end up being still this sort of notion that they were kind of simplistic and so forth. The closest to accurate would have been Clown of the Cave Bear movie. It was actually a book originally. Uh, it's incredibly outdated at this point in terms of its uh, actual anthropological content. Uh, it's a novel. Uh, but uh, I think it was first published in the 60s. So, uh, but... Uh, strangely enough, it, it it depicted them as peaceful vegetarians uh, who, you know, were just trying to get by, and then these humans come in and ruin everything. Uh, and uh, interestingly, as although the humans ruin everything part we haven't sort of uh, borne out, uh, we are starting to find evidence for some Neanderthals at least being vegetarians and. Uh, and certainly a variety of life ways that um, we hadn't thought about before. This is our modern interpretation of, of Neanderthals. Uh, they are like you and me. Uh, take away the dirt, and uh, I don't know why we depict them as if they never bathed. That seems ridiculous to me, why, why they wouldn't... Um, but otherwise, they look very much like you and me. Um, uh, I mean, going beyond sort of surface things like skin color and eye color and that sort of thing. I mean, if you look at them, you don't think that's not a human. And that's really our sort of vision of them today. They really probably looked very much like us, like modern uh, Homo sapiens. Um, and of course... To some degree, our popular depictions of them have changed <laughs> as well. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember the uh, Geico caveman, but uh, um, uh, the tagline was something like, even a Neanderthal can do it, or something like that. Uh, and he regularly took offense at this. Um, but this is true. Like, you know, give him a shave. He's going to look like, just like us. He probably wasn't quite that hairy on the arms and so forth, though. All right, so that's it for our our sort of tour of introduction to Neanderthals. Next time we're going to talk about Neanderthal anatomy and what makes a Neanderthal a Neanderthal. So thank you again. Hope you have a great week, and I will see you soon.